what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And before I introduce you to formally to Keith Bank of KB Partners, uh, Keith, I always like to mention a couple other past episodes people should check out. And since this is like bridging the sports world and the tech world, I'm like thinking, what are their sports related? This isn't really sports tech, but the founder of Big League Chew was really interesting. I had Rob Nelson on how he came up with the shredded bubble gum in the bullpen of uh, his minor league baseball game, um, which just caught fire. uh, And uh, founder of P90X, uh, Tony Horton. And what I like about the stories too, Keith, is not just like the success stories, but he talked about just starting out and driving cross country when he first decided he wanted to do kind of like personal training. And he actually made money as a street mime. So he'd put his head on the street and he would be a street performer. And that's how he made his food and rent money early on when he moved to California. Obviously he's, you know, since uh, selling, you know, whatever, lots of hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X, it's a little bit different now, but that check out many more episodes on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25 and at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships, partnerships, and we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me over the past over decade, um, podcasting has been amazing because I get to profile the people and the relationships I admire and I love, and I get to shout out what they're doing from the rooftops on my podcast and share it with the universe. So if you have thought about podcasting, I would say do it. If you have questions, go to rise25.com, check out more, learn more, and you can email us if you have anything that you uh have a question for. And this is a big shout out to Chris Baskin who introduced me to today's guest, Keith Bank. Um, Keith Bank's the founder and CEO of KB Partners, which is a leading early stage sports and tech VC firm. He's been a highly successful entrepreneur, real estate developer, angel investor prior to starting his own VC firm 26 years ago. And if you go to kbpartners.com and their portfolio page, they have a long list of companies they've been that have been acquired and that they work with, um, including, um, there's a couple on there, Active Network and Rubicon Technology at an IPO, Golf.com that was acquired by Time Inc., and many more companies that we're going to talk about today. Um, He is one of the founders of Illinois Venture Capital Association and was a recipient of their highly coveted Fellows Medal for Leadership. Keith, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Glad to be on on the air with you. You know, um, we were talking about what's top of mind now. And I'd love for you to talk about um, the final closing in the sports tech fund. Yeah. So we, um, you know, we've been uh, investing in this sports tech vertical for about five years now, actively. I had made a few uh, previous angel investments in the space, but um, you know, our first fund uh, we raised in early 2018 that's now fully invested in 16 portfolio companies. We have some money reserved for follow on in those companies. And in early 2021, we set out to raise fund two with a target of hundred million dollars. It was a very audacious and ambitious target because no one had ever raised an early stage sports tech fund anywhere near that size in the past. Um, There've been plenty of venture funds way larger, many times larger, but not in this specific vertical. And pleased to announce, you know, we expect to blow past our $100 million number in the next uh, 30 to 45 days, uh, which will make us you know, the largest early stage sports tech fund ever raised. Uh, we've committed to five investments in the new fund already, uh, which we're super excited about. And uh, I think we've built just a, a phenomenal platform team and we just love, love the space. We think we're really in the early innings, kind of where FinTech was 20 years ago. Um, just so much innovation is occurring and we can talk further about some of the areas which we have investment interest in, but, uh, the space is just exploding. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the companies that you have uh, interest in now and, and before, but, um, talk a little about the criteria. So right now, um, you said there's five investments 
Um, what is the criteria that you're looking for right now for companies that, to invest in? So we, you know, we start with a very large funnel. We see about 1,500 deals a year. We probably meet with between two and 250 companies a year, get into serious due diligence on 20 to 25 and make five, six, seven, eight investments a year. So massive funnel, massive weeding out process. It's a bit of an oxymoron, but we consider ourselves a, a value oriented early stage investor. We usually, most of the deals we do are single digit million pre-money valuations. We wanna own 10 to 30% of these businesses. We have to see certain characteristics. There's lots of really interesting companies with great entrepreneurs, but if they do everything perfectly and execute flawlessly, they might be a 10 or $15 million in revenue business and make a million dollars a year. And those are great businesses, but they aren't going to provide the type of venture returns that we're looking for. So if we don't see a path to at least a 10 X return, if we don't see a path to at least a hundred million in revenue, it usually does not make the cut because, you know, we, again, those are the kinds of returns we're looking to achieve high twenties, low thirties on an IRR basis. We hope our fund returns four to five times. Um, so, you know, those are very hefty targets. And in order to achieve those, you have to be very picky and, a lot of times you can make as much money on the going inside as the going outside if your basis is more reasonable. So we, we try not to get attracted to the next shiny object, pay stupid prices, hoping someone will pay two or three times the stupid <laughs> price down the road. That's just not our style. Um, you know, we're looking for real businesses with real markets, competitive advantage, intellectual property, great teams, you know, all, all, all the standard things. But we're, if anything, in early stage venture, the who is way more important than the what in our mind. The what has to be interesting and compelling, but without the who, you don't stand a fighting chance. So we spend an awful lot of time evaluating the teams we are considering backing. Um, you know, one thing about, I find really unique about what you do is you're very hands-on. You're hands-on as a firm and you kind of roll up your sleeves and, and get in there and give uh, advice and direction and, um, I, I don't know which one would be best to speak to, but there's a bunch of information uh, that I was looking through that people say this exact same thing that I'm saying, like Stan Woodward talks about it, how, you know, the strategy and the partnerships, um, Scott, I'm not sure, uh, Pezzle Tyner, co-founder and chairman of Phoenix also says this, um, Mike Lazaro. So I'm wondering which of these would be best to talk about, um, what advice did you give them? What, like, give me an example of what are some of the things you, you help them with? Yeah, so our, our whole model is, you know, we lead about 90% of the deals that we invest in. We take board seats 90 plus percent of the time. And you can throw darts and you can make a lot of passive bets and, and, and you'll get average returns most likely. But we think to get outstanding returns, you really have to, these companies all need help. It's not that they're not competent or capable. They can all use that key introduction, that key unlock. And that's what we try to provide. We have an advisory board of 16 luminaries from the sports and tech world, all of whom are investors with us. And we can lean on them. We're kind of one step removed from anybody we want to get to in the world of sports or technology. We provide our input in many ways. It could be a key introduction to a missing link to the management team. It could be a key board member that we help recruit. It could be an introduction to a customer or a supplier. It could be with strategy. It could be with helping to fill out a syndicate on a fundraise. Um, you know, wherever and whenever they need help. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of in my career is that you know, the average venture return for early stage venture. If you read the statistics, they'll say about 30% of deals, you get your money back or make a profit and 70% go to zero or get cents back on the dollar. It's a hits based business. And in my career, my hit rec ratio is between 70 and 75%. And I think that's directly attributable to the rolling up your sleeves, sticking with these companies and really doing what it takes to give them a better chance of being successful. It doesn't guarantee success. And we certainly don't have the magic potion that we can wave our wand and, and, and make things successful. But I think through hard work, diligence, time, effort, TLC, all those things being a good partner, you just give your companies a better chance for success. And as a result, entrepreneurs want to work with us and they're willing to, you know, bend to get us in their deals because they know they're going to get that help. And you can't really put a price tag on that in my view. 
Yeah, totally. Um, let's talk about a couple lately. Um, Status Pro. Sure. So that's a company actually in our one of the last deals we did in our first fund. Really interesting company. Um, two minority founders, a former NFL player and a former college quarterback. Um, they had developed an interesting product for uh, elite athlete training using virtual reality, using a headset, basically. And some of the early adopters were the San Francisco 49ers, the Baltimore Ravens, Lamar Jackson's actually, uh, you know, on the cap table and and, and involved with the company. And we thought, you know, kind of interesting, but limited markets. There's only so many pro teams and D1 college teams that are going to pay for this and use it. But as we got to know them a bit better through due diligence, we realized that they were developing a virtual reality based video game to kind of compete with Madden, where the consumer could actually put on this headset and pretend they're Patrick Mahomes or pretend they're their mm. favorite NFL player and see the defense and run the play and see the play. And then we said, boy, that, that's kind of interesting, large market. We spent a lot of time in due diligence, a lot of time with the team. And we ended up leading a round uh, that has just an amazing uh, group of investors. We have co-investors, including uh, Verizon. Uh, We have uh, the Green Bay Packers, the Haslam family that owns the Browns, Microsoft, uh, LeBron James, uh, and his uh, financial management firm that brought some of their other athletes and uh, celebrities to bear. Um, And two other very, very large companies that are in the headset business that uh, most people will know of that have a, you know, strong vested interest in seeing this being successful to help them sell more headsets. So super excited about it. The game is going to be launched in conjunction with the Super Bowl this year. Mm. Um, And we're really excited to see what the, uh, you know, what the outcome is going to be. Is it, um, is that particular game going to be on multiple headsets? So I, you know, a couple months ago got an Oculus Quest 2. Um, and I know there's a bunch of other VR headsets. Will that particular game be on um a yes, couple or it will, it will be on multiple platforms? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I love it. I look forward to the Super Bowl just for that, actually. Um, and then you you also mentioned before we hit record about a training apparel company. Yeah, so this is a company just coming out of stealth mode, actually kind of still in stealth mode, so I can't say too, too much, but we're, um, we're actually backing a team of veteran Nike executives who left and who basically have created a new line of apparel, taking the old concept of a weighted vest that many people would train with, but weighted vests are heavy, they're clunky, they don't move with your body, they're not good for your back and for your joints. And they're using a technology called micro loading where they have developed a way to heat print uh, tiny light weights across the entire breadth and depth of apparel, whether it's long sleeve, short sleeve, tank, uh, vest, tights, shorts. And by training in this apparel that has weight to it, um, when you take it off, you run faster, you jump higher, you throw a ball harder, you hit a tennis ball harder, you hit a golf ball further, all those kinds of things. A lot of science behind it. And uh, it's not only, you know, usually we wouldn't touch an apparel deal with the 10 foot pole, quite honestly. There's a lot of challenges with supply chain and with uh, inventory. This is a direct to consumer business. Um, these guys have incredible um, track records, histories, knowledge, experience. Uh, I've got a Cracker Jack team involved. The former seven-year president of Nike is our independent board member. Um, so just we're ba- we're backing this team. The product is ultra ultra cool. Uh, we think we're going to create a new uh, category um, of sportswear, and uh, the product's probably going to be introduced into the market in the next two to three months. That's great. It seems like you, from my research, you have this love for golf. It seems like some of the companies follow suit. When I look at it, what would be an interesting, I mean, go from full swing to golf to, you know, there's a bunch of kind of supreme golf, golf companies on here. Who would, what would be an interesting one to talk about in the golf realm? Probably the most interesting part is we haven't made one golf investment in either of our funds. All those deals were in my angel investment prior to our fund, but probably the one that has gotten the most acclaim and was wildly successful is a company called club champion golf. Uh, it's a company I started uh, with a couple other guys. Um, and the idea was to make uh, custom clubs, both 
in the fitting side and in the building side more accessible to the average golfer when you play with properly fitted equipment your scores go down uh, we've done a lot of studies on that and we basically took a concept that had been around but mostly with mom and pop operators that really didn't know how to scale a business and how to run a business in a way that it could be financially successful a bunch of hobbyists basically and came up with a model uh, a retail model which again ordinarily we wouldn't touch a retail concept with a 10-foot pole but i just had an inkling that this one had a chance for success and we started with uh you know one location in chicago and grew it to what what by uh probably the end of the year will be close to 100 locations in the u.s and we sold the business to two different pe firms um and are definitely the you know kind of the largest player in the, in the world in the space and the company's been wildly successful our investors made a ton of money and uh you know, I'm not as involved anymore. I'm still on the board, but not involved in the day to day. But I mean, you know, this was in my entrepreneurial days before I had the fun. I mean, I, you know, did the first 65 real estate locations, wow. kind of came up with the concept, the logos, the color scheme, the name of the company, the, you know, put the team together, uh, you know, raise the money, all, all the things that go into starting a company. So, um, you know, our team that is still there is, you know, doing a great job executing. Um, Joe Lee and Nick Sherburn, uh, two of my partners, you know, have done a great, Brian Burke, uh, have done a really nice job, uh, you know, growing and scaling the business. But, um, you know, most people lose a lot of money investing in golf. It's a very tough space into which to invest. It happens to be hot right now because of COVID and, uh, you know, breaking all kinds of records in the last year. But, um, you know, I've made multiple investments in the golf space and, Thank goodness they've they've all worked out well. So, Keith, there's so many moving pieces with that. Um, I'm wondering what was one of the biggest challenges when you were creating that and you know launching a hundred, you know, actually bringing up and creating a hundred different locations. What was what was a challenging point? I mean, a lot of challenges. One is uh, you know getting the right team in place. <clears throat> Two is you know figuring out a way to actually make money and scale the business and do it in a, in a, in a way where you can make real margins and, and be able to cookie cutter. You know, we came up with a model of a footprint and, you know, how we were going to set up that footprint, how are you going to supply it? You know, a lot of people prior to that, the same person fitting your clubs actually built your clubs. And we said, well, that's not scalable. So we built a central build facility where every location around the country, we build everything in Chicago. We ship it. The, the model originally was, you know, you come in for a fitting within seven to 10 days, you get your custom clubs in your hands, you know, built, delivered, uh, you know, to your store where you got your fitting, whether it's in Boston or Philadelphia or Los Angeles, Atlanta, wherever it is. Supply chain with COVID, we're a little slower than that right now, just because it's a, a lot of challenges. But basically, we just figured out a way to to grow and scale a business and make it consistent across location. So we put a training program in place for our fitters where they came to Chicago for a month and went through an exhaustive training procedure, not only how to fit the clubs, but how to talk to the customer, how to upsell, how to cross sell, how to treat, handle complaints, how to, you know, just, just really, you know, have people dress the same way, have them act the same way, have them, you know, deliver, you know, in their own way, but a more standardized kind kind of process. So, so really just putting a repeatable um, model together and then executing on that is very challenging. It's very challenging. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like a really comprehensive training program in general. Yep. And deploying it. Um, talk about Chicago Select Golf Invitational a little bit. Yeah, so that's a personal passion of mine. I started it 26 years ago, actually when I was in the real estate business before I got into the venture business. I just I'd given money to charity, but I'd never really done anything to make a difference and I just uh, a lot of my family and friends have been devastated with cancer and it's one of my pet charities and um I approached the American Cancer Society in Chicago and said I want to try to figure out a way to raise your money and I got an idea I'd like to put together an elite high-end golf tournament for you and raise some serious money and the executive director at the time then said kind of laughed a little and said okay you know whatever if you want to try something whatever 
And um, we started the event in 1995 and had it at Medina Country Club, course number three, which has hosted a bunch of majors and Ryder Cup. And um, our first year, we netted about $90,000 through the event. And it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And over the course of the event, after this year, we'll have raised almost $12 million in the fight against cancer through the event. People fly in from all over the country to play in this thing. We have an amazing auction. People get a ton of gifts. They walk away like it's Christmas in August with all the great stuff, great food, great golf, um, great live and silent auction. Um, one of the unique things that a couple of years in I implemented was in our auction featuring the Golf Digest top 100 courses where you could buy the ability to go play Marion or Oakmont or Shinnecock. And uh, I think one year at our peak, we had 56 of the top 100 courses in our auction, and we sold $390,000 worth of, you know, hosted foursomes for crazy nut job golfers like me that want to go play all these great <laughs> courses. Um, and uh, it's just been a passion. So I chaired the event for the first 16 or 17 years, still very involved in terms of on the committee and helping, but I'm not running it on more our chairman this year. He's doing an amazing job. He actually is one of our investors and advisors on our fund. Um, and it's growing this year. I think we're going to break a record. I think we're going to raise about a million two this year at the, at the event in one day. So congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. From scratch to, to raising, you know, over $10 million. Um, what else makes it unique? So you have some unique things as far as the auction goes. Um, is it capped at a certain point? Um, well, this year, for the first time, we have all three courses at Medina. They have 54 holes, and we've sold out all three courses. So we have 111 foursomes playing. I've got some great sponsors. Again, we just kill people with kindness. It's just it's just that the day of event is fantastic. There's all kind of fun contests. Again, you walk away with all these gifts. You get fed. Oh, you're about to burst. You you know, we, we've had some interesting speakers over the year. We had David Faraday one year, who was hilarious. Um, you know, we've had, we had a Miss America one year, we've had, we've had some, you know, some wild, wild things. It's really not a celebrity driven event. It's more of the celebrity is the caliber of the event itself. Mm -hmm. But, um, I don't know when you build a reputation, it grows and people hear about it and they want to participate in it. I'm curious, Keith, you know, growing up, um, I love to hear how you got into this VC world, but growing up, what did you want to, what did you want to do? So I always, I, you know, my dad and my grandfather were both what I would call small time entrepreneurs, grew up in a very middle class family, very middle class. I was one of those guys that actually said, oh, I'm never going to join a country club and be a golfer, those rich snobs. And, you know, I was one of those guys. And, you know, now, you know, I take my words back. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I just. What did I your think, dad and grandpa do? What did uh, they? They were both uh, kind of in the residential real estate business. They rehabbed mm -hmm. old houses. And my grandfather used to say, you know, your dad likes to slaughter the cow because my dad would buy them and rehab them and sell them. My grandfather would rent them out. He said, I'd like to milk the cow. You know, your dad liked to slaughter the cow. But, you know, low end stuff and some fairly rough neighborhoods. But I grew up working for them in the summertime and I just a lot of business talk around the dinner table. And I just decided I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. And it's funny because the same dinner table, my brother grew up and became a, a cardiologist and, you know, not entrepreneurial. And my sister ended up moving to Israel. So, you know, go, go figure. Um, but uh, so I just always knew I wanted to do something, you know, on my own, kind of be my own boss. Not, not that I couldn't work for other people, but just, I guess, uh, you know, like to try new challenges. I've done a lot of crap, produced two feature films along the way, just as passion projects, not because I love the film business or thought it was, a, I just wanted to try my hand at it and read some books that I thought would make interesting film material. And so I just, I like challenges and I like meeting people. When you were at Wharton, did you have a better idea at that point? Honestly, not, you know, no. you know, this is a, you know, a top business school and then went to Kellogg and most of the people go into consulting or they go into investment banking or, you know, the more traditional stuff. I got out of uh, undergrad, took a job in corporate America and quit after three months and decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur and spent a year trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Looked at some businesses to potentially buy, to potentially start. And um, 
you know, just they've always liked the kind of the thrill of the hunt. What did you decide at that point? So you get out, you're like, corporate America is not for me. What you I do? looked around for a long time. I looked at a bunch of different businesses. I ended up starting a deep discount drugstore in St. Louis, which is where I was from. Hmm. Copied after a concept in Cleveland, Ohio, that had been wildly successful called Marks. And um, shortly after opening the business, I decided to sell my interest and go to business school at Kellogg, which is how I ended up in Chicago. But it kind of gave me the entrepreneurial bug and the entrepreneurial itch. And then um, out of business school, I, I went in the commercial real estate development world for about a decade. And, you know, it was pretty entrepreneurial. I was a principal at a partner at a, at a firm. It wasn't my firm, but, um, um, you know, you could be pretty entrepreneurial and create your own projects and own opportunities. And then just started as a glorified angel investor, for lack of a better term, towards the tail end of my real estate. I started investing in the tech economy. This is kind of circa 1995, 96. The internet was just getting started. Cell phone technology was just emerging. And I thought Chicago and the Midwest had a real void for early stage venture money. Made some angel investments, had some good early success. And one day I walked in my real estate partners and said, I'm leaving to go start a venture capital firm. And they said, what do you know about venture capital? I said, not much, but I'll figure it out. It can't be that complicated. And that was, you know, 26 years ago. And so this, I've been at it ever since, but again, done some other crazy things along the way, like these movies and done some other startups and other things along the way, but, but it's all been around entrepreneurship and early stage companies. Um, yeah, I, I actually lived in Baldwin. So I, I, maybe I ran into your deep discount somewhere. Um, the, when you say crazy startup, talk about uh, a few of the ones that stick out. One, which is kind of interesting. Um, we backed in our first fund uh, two guys in business school while they were still in business school at Kellogg. It's a company called Ethnic Grocer. And these guys had an idea for selling ethnic foods over the internet to the person in Paducah, Kentucky that couldn't get their ingredients for their Vietnamese food or the person in Tallahassee, Florida that couldn't get their favorite Norwegian food, whatever. And the concept was, was really interesting. Um, uh, the guys were really sharp. Uh, we were the first investor. We put up a million bucks and bought a third of the business. And shortly thereafter, you know, the internet just started taking off like crazy and everybody and their brother was starting an internet business. We ended up bringing in money from some of the top venture firms in the world, Kleiner Perkins, Benchmark, Super Value, Amarindo, Integral, uh, all these guys were, and we raised a boatload of money. We got way out over our skis uh, and it ended up being a big fireball for everybody. But it was a great lesson that, you know, when you're doing 40 orders a week, you shouldn't build a tech infrastructure to uh, handle 40,000 orders a week. And you shouldn't lease 50,000 square feet of office space and you shouldn't hire dozens of employees. And uh, we just got out ahead of ourselves and it was kind of, they were the go, go, you know, go bigger, go home days. And, um, you know, it was a great, great, great lesson. Um, you know, it was all, you know, the, we got caught up in the whole Silicon Valley, you know, you know, you know, Mary Meeker saying we're going to be a billion dollar company and all, all this stuff. And you start to read your press clippings and, um, that was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a, in retrospect, a really good experience. It was a painful experience, but, uh, you know, really, really interesting. You know, oftentimes Keith, we remember our first deal or one of our first deals as a VC and from your VC firm, wh- what do you remember as one of those initial deals that still, uh, sticks out? Well, that was one of them for sure. Okay. That one, um, you know, we had another, um, you know, you, I think you sometimes remember your failures as much as your successes, you know, like, where did I go wrong? What could I have done differently? Um, you know, and it, it's hard when sometimes you fall in love with the technology, you know, and maybe you don't have the right team in place or the right people to execute on it. And um, so there's really not, um, you know, I guess the first IPO was pretty exciting. You know, that was a neat. Yeah. Talk about that. We've done a few. Which was that? Um, 
a company called Rubicon Technology. They had, um, this is when we were doing strictly tech stuff, nothing to do with sports. But uh, matter of fact, I had the CEO in my office just an hour ago who's still a dear friend and an investor with us. But um, we had a company, they had developed this um, crystal sapphire substrate, which is basically the raw material that goes into making LEDs that were used in all kinds of microelectronics and other uh, things. And they had figured out a way to make the best, the purest, the you know, all these great attributes. And they had, i never forget, we had a facility in uh, Western suburbs and these furnaces that would heat up to 6,000 degrees and, and, and melt this stuff. And, you know, it was really crazy stuff. But a bunch of Russian scientists has invented this. And again, this was a company that at one point in time was really challenged, was burning an awful lot of money. Um, we ended up having to swap out a CEO and the new CEO we brought in in less than a year's time, got the company from hemorrhaging a ton of cash to making a ton of cash, took them public and uh, was just a rock star of a CEO. Um, and I said he was just in my office today because we've remained very close friends. Um, but it was, again, really interesting to see a company really that was had a great product. But just the management was not up to snuff and we brought in one guy, turned the whole thing around into a rousing success. Everybody made a lot of money. Um, you know, it was just a, it was fun, fun to that see. That is amazing. How did you find that person and what did they do when they came in? Um, his name is Raja Parvez and he's a, um, freak of nature. He, he uh, is just a, got a will to win, came to the U S with, I think $8 in his pocket from Pakistan, ended up becoming a Bell Labs fellow, uh, which is like the highest you can get at Bell Labs. Like the, 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 the half a percent of the 1% of the 1% went on to, you know, run a couple of, uh, crazy stuff. I mean, he was reminding me today, you know, as he's a Muslim and he was uh, running an Israeli company in Israel as a Muslim back. And he was telling me like what used to happen at the airport and all this stuff. And, but he's got a zillion friends over there. You know, he was welcomed with open arms and uh, we recruited him uh, when he was coming off a, a success for uh, that company and a Japanese company that he had been recruited to. And I think we just, kind of got lucky. We, we, we found a guy, we didn't know how good he was when we hired him, but, um, you know, a 24 um, seven, what did you do to recruit him? Cause I imagine it sounds like he probably had a bunch of other offers or opportunities. You know, he was looking for an entrepreneurial opportunity. He was coming off, um, a company that had just gotten sold. And I just think he saw something where his skill set would mesh with what this company was doing. And um, you know, again, timing is everything. There's luck involved. Um, you know, we've brought in other CEOs that haven't been as good. You know, just you know, you you try to pick and choose carefully, and sometimes you you nail it, and other times you know you you don't. What did you see from an outside perspective? What he did to come when he came in? I mean, again, like when I say freak of nature, I mean he, this guy is just a he'll do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, twenty four seven. I mean, he would hop on a plane to go to China for eight hours and turn around and come home. I mean, you know, like just whatever it took. If he had to have a key customer meeting and he wanted to be there face to face, he did it. And, um, you know, he I think the employees respect it and you, know, you lead by example and then you get other people to buy into it. And um, so self-taught guy, too. He wasn't a business by training. He was, a, you know. I think one or two PhDs and, you know, really technical in nature um, and kind of self-taught businessman. What do you see, Keith? Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I could definitely see someone just hopping on a plane, like some of those examples of, yeah, I'm just going to go there for eight hours, meet and fly home. Um, <clears throat> what are some mistakes people you see people make or um, in the acquisition process? Because, you, you know, your companies have been, you've had a number of companies get acquired. What are some big mistakes or, or things mistakes to watch on out the, for? On the acquiring side or on the selling side? On the selling side. Um, I think sometimes you can overplay your hand a little bit. You know, if you try to extract the last dollar, I mean, we negotiate hard and we you know, want to get the best price and terms for our investors. We're a fiduciary and um, we have that responsibility, but 
you know, timing is important and, you know, you can be in the midst of a deal and, and there's a, a change in leadership in the acquiring company and the deal could go to hell. Um, you could, uh, you know, rub somebody the wrong way and they end up buying one of your competitors instead. Um, time does kill deals if it takes too long. A lot of times, you know, the result is not great. So I, I think it's an art more than a science. Um, and, uh, you know, the more you do it, hopefully the better you get at it. Um, you know, to me, the win-win situations are the best where the acquiring company is crazy happy, even if they maybe think they overpaid for it a little bit. And when the selling company is really happy, even if they felt like they gave it away too inexpensively, there were both sides, um, you know, maybe feel like, but they're, but they're happy. The end result is everybody did, did well. And, um, you know, the worst thing is if you sell something to somebody and either they screw it up or it turns out to not be, you know, that's not a good feeling. You don't want people to, uh, but I mean, I mean, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of stories of big companies acquiring companies and messing them up and the founder buying them back for cents on the dollar and all that stuff. Cause either cultural reasons or, uh, you know, many other reasons. So you hear those stories all the time. I love to hear. So what made you start the Illinois Venture Capital Association? So I didn't start it. I was okay. one of a handful of founders who got together. And this was in the early days when Chicago and the Midwest really didn't have a lot of venture money. And we just thought by combining our resources and hiring an executive director and being able to to lobby for stuff in Springfield that would be beneficial to the venture capital industry, to have a trade association, uh, to bring credibility that, you know, Chicago and Illinois does and could have a tech economy when you're, you know, fighting against the Austins and the Bostons and the Silicon Valleys. So, you know, I, I don't even remember whose idea it was. I, I can't take credit for the idea. I was a participant in helping get it off the ground. And, uh, you know, it's been a really, really good organization on a lot of levels. Did it do early on what you wanted it to do as far as? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think it did. I think it, again, brought some credibility and it's not, it's called the Illinois Venture Capital Association, but it also includes uh, private equity firms. It also includes some service providers. So basically anybody that's involved in the investing in companies ecosystem um, yeah. And I think it's been, it's been, it's been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I find it, it's just really interesting. You kind of go like, I'm going to do this, this VC thing. I'm going to, uh, you know, figure it out. And then you end up helping, you know, kind of, uh, form an association around it too. So, yeah, again, I won't take a lot of the credit for that, but, uh, look, I, I've always believed and it's just how you're wired short of being a rocket scientist or brain surgeon, you can pretty much do whatever you want if you put your mind to it and you have a little bit of intelligence and uh, work ethic. So, you know, a lot of people are just fearful because they don't have a risk appetite and they're f afraid of failure or afraid of whatever they're afraid of, or they don't have the financial resources to my attitude when I was younger, I didn't have any money. So if I lost everything I had, it wasn't that much. So, you know, I'd be back where I was, I'd, you know, start over again. Um, but not everybody's wired that way. I mean, lots of people just want a safe job and they're happy doing that or, or unhappy doing that. Um, I've just always wanted uh, personal challenges and, and growing myself as a person, intellect, growing my network, uh, and just find it. I look, I, I can't wait to get up every morning and hate going to bed because, you know, I like doing what I, I'm doing. It doesn't feel like work. And I've kind of taught my kids too. If you, if you love what you do, it doesn't feel like work and the financial spoils will usually follow. And if you hate what you do, um, they probably won't. And, you know, it's no way to go through life. Are uh, Keith, any of your kids entrepreneurs? So my son um, is the chief operating officer of a video streaming technology company in Chicago called Phoenix Real-Time Solutions. And um, interesting story, he was working in the commercial real estate world and called me up one day about four or five years ago and said, dad, you know, I love what I'm doing. They like me, it's great, blah, blah, blah. But I wanna go to work for an early stage tech company. I said, quit your job and go find something. 
And he did. But little did I know that three or four months in, he would come back to me and say, Dad, this is a really interesting company. I think you should invest in it. <laughs> and uh, so we're actually the lead investor in the company. And we've got the largest investment I and we have ever made. And we think it's a really, really exciting, interesting company. But um, well, you intimately so, know the management. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. So um, and what does it do? Uh, we have developed some very novel technology around real-time video streaming. So kind of the current state of the art is when you're watching a video stream of a sporting event, for example, last year's Super Bowl, I think there were nine or 10 different providers and the latency ranged from 30 seconds to five minutes behind the action. Wow. Field. Holy so cow. if you were watching it on your iPad, your cell phone, your uh, smart TV, you'd be way behind the action. You've heard the term spoiler alert and all these things. But it's really important when it comes to betting and in-game micro wagering in particular. So this uh, Stefan Beer, who's the tech genius behind this, he actually got his PhD in video streaming at, at Northwestern in the early 2000s before anyone even knew what video streaming was. And he basically re-architected an open source standard called WebRTC that Google had developed for video chat. And it was developed um, for speed, because when we have a Zoom call or anything like this, you know, you have to have real time communication, but it wasn't architected for scale. It's for a few people to a few people. Stefan basically took the two endpoints of WebRTC and re-architected everything in the middle and wrote about two million lines of code and basically um, allows video to be transmitted with 300 milliseconds of latency, so less than half a second regardless of what device you're on and that anyone around the world will see the same uh, action within one video frame or, you know, one tenth of one second of each other. So we scale to broadcast sized audiences, tens of millions of people in total synchronicity and sub half second latency. So why is that important in the case of in-game micro wagering on sports, which is where it's going you know, if you want to bet, is the next pitch a ball or a strike? Is the next player a run or a pass? Is Tiger Woods going to make this putt? Is James Harden going to make this free throw? No one's going to take your bet if it's 30 seconds behind and they know what already happened, but um, we enable that. So we, uh, you know, we think we are the enabling technology and the platform technology for not only for that, there's lots of applications across auction platforms and uh, trivia, quizzes, other things where real-time information is, at scale is important. I could be wrong, Keith, but I think Mark Cuban early on had, you know, it was in the same genre of broadcasting sports, right? Is that how he started out? Uh, yeah, I mean, his company was uh, in that area, but not in anything. No, like not like this, yeah, but yeah. same type of, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, I love to hear of, you know, mentors or colleagues that have influenced you in your thinking. Uh, sure. So um, you know, my mentors have, I'd say, probably more been mentors from a distance, like people that I, like I was a huge John Wooden fan growing mm. up, the UCLA legend. Me too. Oh, yeah. So totally. I carried around in my wallet all of his favorite sayings, all his, his uh, you know, Woodenisms and his pyramid of success and all that. So, you know, he really had a big impact on me. And my favorite saying that people, my kids are tired of me telling it to him, but, you know, things turn out best for those who make the best of the way things turn out. He just had a million of these great little sayings that if you live your life that way, um, it's very, very impactful. So he, and I wrote a paper on him when I was in third grade and, oh, wow. and I just, I just, I have all the stuff at home still. I, I just, uh, so he, he, he was a real influence. And then I had a basketball coach. I played on this United States youth games team, which was, uh, was basically me and, 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 and a bunch of inner city kids. And we played in this national tournament and we had this uh, legendary coach named Jody Bailey, who coached at Northwest High School in St. Louis in the inner city and was just an amazing, amazing man. Uh, it just had so many uh, brilliant things to say about how to live life and and also a great basketball coach. So I'd, I'd say those, you know, were two of, two of the biggest impacts um, on me and in, in, uh, that helped me develop my thought process early on. Yeah. 
I would love to hear, Keith, your favorite business books. And, and I am a huge John Wooden fan. Um, the, someone gave me um, his book, Wooden, and I think I've read it probably over a dozen times for sure. My favorite one is, I think it's a tribute to him, but don't mistake activity with achievement. So I think of that if I'm feeling busy, well, is this really achieving anything or am I, or the famous story of obviously him teaching his players to tie their shoelaces properly, yep. put their shoes on, their socks on, tie their shoes properly, you know, the fundamentals, even, you know, the greats, you know, whatever, Bill Walton or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, all of them went through that. So yeah, I totally appreciate you sharing that. Um, some of your favorite books, it could be business books or, or whatever type of books um, are no. your favorites. I have to admit, I, I'm generally, I, I pour over magazines, online stuff, newspapers, but on the book side, I wish I had more time to read books. I just, I, I work too much and have too many other things that I enjoy doing, even though I love reading. So, um, you know, I, I um, most of what I read is for enjoyment when I do have the time. You know, I've read my share of, you know, business books or self-help kinds of things, but I don't know, mo most of the stuff I find in those are pretty commonsensical types, types of things. Um, and uh, I know, and I'm embarrassed because like, and I see all these other interviews with people, they say, oh, what are the five books you've read in the last, you know, whatever. And they name all these, and I, you know, I've heard of them all, but I haven't read them because they haven't had time to do such. So um, I'm sure you do a lot of research when you're uh, investigating all the companies. Yeah, I do a ton, in, ton so. of reading. I'm more of a magazine, newspaper, online uh, reader than I am a cover to cover book reader. Keith. First of all, thank you. I have one last question for you. And I just want to thank you for your time, your lessons, your stories. Everyone can go to kbpartners.com and learn more. Are there any other places we should point people online to learn more? About us? Specifically? Yeah, about you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think, you know, if they Google us, they'll probably, you know, pull up a bunch of press releases of companies in which we've invested or exits we've had, whatever. Um, you know, we're pretty, um, we fly kind of under the radar. We don't do a ton of self-promotion. We don't do a ton of, um, you know, tooting our horn. Um, I think we will hopefully put out some type of uh, story or release in conjunction with raising this new fund, which, you know, I think will set some milestones for, for, for funds in this space. Um, but I think reading the backgrounds of some of our advisory board members, actually the bios are all on our website. It's kind of, kind of interesting to see the mix of people that have, um, and, and not just our advisory board members, people obviously don't know, and I can't share who our LPs are, but you know, our investors are team owners, league commissioners, high profile professional athletes, fortune 100 CEOs. You know, we've always just liked taking money from people who have an interest in what we're doing and might be helpful um, not that we wouldn't take institutional money, but uh, in our view, that's more just money. Whereas the folks that we've surrounded ourselves with, we think add a bunch of value beyond just the, the check they write. So it's always kind of been my philosophy. Yeah, no, I love it. Yeah. You have a rockstar team, rockstar advisory board. Um, people can go to kbpartners.com and learn more. My last question, it seems like you, it seems like you grew up playing basketball, baseball, you're an avid golfer. When it comes to your athletic achievements or playing on a certain course or field or whatever it is, what sticks out to you as um, maybe your favorite game or um, personally from, from your standpoint? I'd say a couple of things. One is I got the pleasure of taking my daughter to the Super Bowl uh, when it was in Miami and just being able to share something like that with your daughter, who's not really a sports fan and who uh, ordinarily, you know, I'd be taking my son or going with friends or whatever. That was just so awesome to be able to share that with her and, and share the couple of days of being around all the excitement and the action and the hoopla and the celebrities and all that. It was just really fun to see the joy in her, in her face. And then and I've taken a lot of great golf trips with my son. You know, he's an avid golfer too, and there's nothing better than a father son golf trip. And, being able to share that, um, you know, we having a shared interest. And, and uh, so I think it's as much about who you're with uh, than it is the actual, you know, I've been to a lot of, you know, final fours and Super Bowls and playoffs and that stuff. But if you're not with someone, you know, you care about to share it with, it, it 
doesn't have quite the same oomph. So yeah, totally. Everyone check check out kbpartners.com and learn more. And Keith, thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Take care. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.